You know, there's nothing like cracking that, that cellophane and pulling that record out. It just smells great. Welcome to Buzz Mayhem Hour. Non-stop hardcore energy. I love the show, guys. You're awesome. Yeah. Unlike any other. With your host, John the Bod, a.k.a. The Bodfather. Man, this stuff rocks. Hey, it's Sahaj from the band Ra, and you're listening to Bod's Mayhem Hour. The views and opinions of the guests do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of Bod's Mayhem Radio Network and staff, affiliates, or sponsors. Parental discretion is advised. Welcome to Bod's Mayhem Radio Network. Hey everybody, welcome to Bod's Mayhem Hour. I'm your host, John the Bod, a.k.a. the Bod Father. And as always, I bring you guys and gals awesome interviews. Today, it's an honor and a huge privilege to welcome Sahaj Tickerton of Raw back to the show. It's been seven years, and it's it's hard to say, man. It's, it's been seven years since the last Raw studio album, and now Raw has released their new album titled Intercorrupted. The uh, Wake Up Music rocks. The album has guest features from LeJohn Witherspoon of Seven Dust and Dustin Bates of Star Set. Check out Raw's new singles that's out right now. And also, please, please check out this band. You will not be disappointed. So, Saj, welcome back to the show, man. And how you doing? I'm pretty good, man. It's been, uh, it's been a crazy year, obviously, for everybody. And it has been a very intense lead up to this release. There's a lot of moving pieces. You know, I, I keep talking about how seven years ago you made a record and you put it out and you did a few things for promo and that was pretty much it. I mean, you had, you know, social media was around, but now it's like, holy crap, I got, I got, you know, I got pages and places I didn't know I had pages. Now I'm like literally out there, you know, constantly posting, constantly promoting and, you know, the band has sort of a, weird challenge there's two things you know obviously being inactive for seven years um you think it's just one of those things where you're inactive then you're active but the fact is is when you're inactive um restarting algorithms that have to do with your project is actually quite difficult and when you have a band name that has two letters in it that doesn't help either because obviously everything in the world i mean we lose 99 percent of our battles to rheumatoid arthritis because if you put RA in, if you put RA in Google, you're going to get 150,000 rheumatoid arthritis sites before you see us. So, you know, the first thing is if you're searching for us, you got to search a Ra and then either Ra the band or Ra and a song title like Ra. Do you call my name or Rectifier or Fallen Angels or or Intercorrupted? The good thing about Intercorrupted is is that it's a made up word, so there's no such real. Thing. So if you put Intercorrupted into a search, you're very likely going to find us. So that was sort of the logic behind that. <laughs> does it feel like you guys are starting all over again, though? I mean, does it really feel that way, uh, making this new no, album? We, no, not at all. It, we have, we've always had our core few thousand people that, that just don't go anywhere. They're just, it's amazing. You know, I'm pretty active on social media because I, I produce so many bands and I write with so many bands. So I'm co- I'm constantly online and uh, without ever really talking about doing another record, there's always been sort of the underlying hope that we might come back and do something at some point. Um, the timing of it all really just worked out really well. I started to see a lot of other bands coming back that had been gone and, you know, and, and I'm friends with uh, some of the guys that are in Static X and they did their thing and I don't know, it just all started to make a little bit of sense, and then I was doing stuff that sort of put me in a position to perform again, and then I got the itch, and I was like, oh, now I want to perform, and then, then we did Ship Rock, and everything has just been sort of like, you know, uh, sort semi-planned, right? Because we had a good plan, and then COVID came and ruined the plan. But in COVID coming and ruining the plan, we were able to sort of realign and retarget and it just gave me time to sort of push off the delivery date of the album so I could sort of spend more time, um, you know, with sound design and trying to create a real um, tapestry that felt like the band but also didn't feel like 2005. Right. So, you know, it was, there was a lot of sort of... And I keep talking about this. I've been talking about it the last few days, but... Um, 
I think this album is, is good, at least by my definition of good. I think this album is good because of the planning. I learned a lot from Dustin and how he sort of functions within the universe of Star Set and how he um, compartmentalizes the way that he creates an album as if it's almost like there are checklists and you have to meet certain criteria in order to make a record. I mean, I always thought of that, but I never thought of it in a sort of in a hard format as opposed to like with the older records, the raw stuff, there was always sort of this amorphic idea of I'm going to write 40 songs and just pick the 10 or 12 best ones. And with this, it was more of like, no, I need this song to cut this category. I need this song to be in the, I need, what's this record's rectifier? What's this record's sky? What's this record's, you know, um, Fallen Angels, watch this record, Super Mega Dubstep. Like it, every every single thing needed to have a representation, in my opinion, but they all needed to also be sort of utterly contemporary and sound like 2020 or 2021 in order for me personally to feel like it was successful as a, as a work of art. Yeah, I know the last time that I had you on here, I was like, man, we need to get some stuff from Raw, and you're just like, uh, well... <laughs> We'll see what happens. We're not gonna let the cat out of the bag just as yet. And I was going, all right. Hopefully that's a that's a good thing here because, you know, you guys have put out some great music before, and um, I'm glad that you guys have a new album out. So, kudos to you guys for for now. You know what I mean? So yeah. Yeah. It 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 feels you know it's weird to take seven years off, but but somehow it feels really appropriate. And um, you know, it's uh, there are a few things that I think that a lot of people may or may not associate with the band. And, and, and one of the things is that it's all in-house. There's no, you know, I, I produce and write with other bands, and so obviously I wouldn't need a producer and I wouldn't need outside writers per se, um, except on the songs that I collaborated on on this record with like Dustin and stuff. But the, um, the, the, real, the real sort of secret sauce of a raw record is the fact that it's, it exists in a vacuum. It's, it's my sort of little private universe that I get to um, construct literally from nothing. So there's no part of this process that isn't sort of me directly. So, you know, the only thing that gets outsourced in terms of the music is um, the mastering. So I, I have Paul Logos master the record, but as far as creating the album, I mean, from the second the first demo is created to the finished mixes, it's all one universe. It's just me by myself, basically, you know, sort of constructing as the producer and as the writer. And then, you know, making this record, the you know, some, the rules of making this record were that it had to be the original guys. Because if it couldn't be the original guys, I don't think I even would have made a raw record. I might have mm -hmm. made sort of a sol another Sahaj solo record or something like that. But, in approaching them, you know, I had this big long speech uh, about, you know, how I was going to do my sales pitch and I was going to try and convince these guys to get back in. And it was all, it was all, you had me at hellos. As soon as I said hi, I was like, hey, what do you think about doing another record? They were like, yep, let's go, ready. <laughs> and I was like, oh, there was no, there was no sales pitch. Everybody was just sort of gung ho about it. And we're all in different spaces in our lives so that we were able to, you know, think about it the right way. You know, none of us are looking at this about getting a Grammy or none of us are looking at this about selling millions of copies and, and being in the top of the charts. We're looking at this as this is something we love and we want to do it for the people that care. You know, there's a few hundred thousand people out there that genuinely love this band and that's who this is for. You know, if that, we, if we can turn those few hundred thousand into a couple million, I'll be super stoked, but I'm also not, you know, really, that particularly focused on that as much as just trying to get as many people to actually hear it so it has a chance to grow. Writing the new album, Intercorrupted, did it challenge you guys as, as a band because of COVID bringing this album to life or no? Not really. You know, that's one of the benefits of um, sort of everything being in-house. I mean, literally in-house, like it's in my house. <laughs> so it's right, uh, the right. studio is just the studio is just downstairs. So I, I didn't have there's no limitations because I'm not rec I, I'm not dependent on anyone. If anyone, if anything, it gave me more time to sort of fine tune things. But you know, in in cutting the drums, uh, um, I flew down to New Orleans and 
Scooter has uh, New Bridge Recording Studios, which is his recording studio. It's, it's attached to the building that he lives in, and the studio's fantastic. So um, we recorded the drums there, and then uh, PJ flew out sometime, I want to say October-ish, to uh, put the bass down. Actually, no, it was September. He came in September to put the bass down. And as we um, got closer to fine-tuning and finishing all the pieces, I sent everything off to Ben. And then Ben has a little home recording studio because he runs his sound healing business out of his house, so he has a recording studio. And he was able to track all the extra guitar parts at his place and just send them to me. So it really was... it. There wasn't a lot of... Um, effort in terms of getting it done as much as just sort of my finishing the songs enough so that the drums could be played and that the bass could be played and that the you know and that everything needed to be added appropriately but um weirdly this record wasn't hard to write you know I, but but i honestly if i'm truthful none of the records were hard to write the difference to me is when i listen to critical mass or i listen to uh black sun i feel as if there are a couple of filler songs on both of those records. I think there are some songs that are good, but not amazing. And on this record, I'm very satisfied with every track doing its job and being, you know, what it is that I wanted to see from this record. So um, there's not a lot of second guessing you know, from my perspective when it comes to this album. So these songs that are on this album, Shahaz, are these songs that didn't make any previous albums, or are these all brand new songs? So because I produce and write for so many bands, um, there are maybe three... Yes, there are exactly three songs on this record that were written for other artists, and oh, wow. then I ended up taking them back. Okay. So the song, the song that Dustin sings on, the Star Set guy, when he sing, he's singing on a song called "Enough." Enough was originally written as a Star Set song for the album Division, and just in the process of putting all together all the songs, we realized that Enough didn't really fit the album. So we said, okay, let's put it on the side, and then we started writing um, what I'm call, what we're calling LP4, which is the fourth. Star Set record, which is what he's working on now, um, we realized that, that, that enough probably wouldn't fit that anyway. But I had already secretly decided that I was going to take it back and make it a raw song before even approaching Dustin about singing on it. But, you know, he's never done a feature before, and he's super, he's super particular and very, very um, you know, protective of his brand. It, but in terms of doing a feature... It probably is a safe bet to do a feature on a song that was originally written for your band. <laughs> so he, uh, he I, I, I used all my leverage and begged him to do it, and he and he did it. He did it graciously, and we had a great time doing it. And he sounds really awesome on it. The other song <laughs> that uh, there's two other songs. So there, there's a song called "I Can't Go On," which to me is sort of like this record's super mega dubstep. It's like weird. It's like medley, but it has like a funness to it, and it's high energy and it's fast. Um, that song, weirdly, was actually, the original demo of that song was actually written for Ice Nine Kill. Oh, wow. So I, was, I wrote that song and submitted it for their last record, but I actually submitted it after they had already finished selecting what they were going to do. So they, they never used the song, and I just sort of put it on a shelf, and when I realized that it was really more of a raw song than anything else, I just went and took it back and you know did the Arabic bridge in it and the whole thing. And then the other song, which um, I actually didn't think about this until just talking to you now, but the other song that was written for someone else, and then I pulled it back and used it on this record, is the one I did with Lejean. So there's a song called Nobody Loves You, and I originally did that song, weirdly, for Tommy <laughs> Beck's solo album, which was going to be something he was going to do before the new Bad Wolves record, but of course now he's been kicked out of the band, so there is no... Tommy Vex Bad Wolves record coming. There is only a Tommy Vex solo record coming, in which I have a different song, I believe, on that one. But uh, Nobody Loves You was originally written for Tommy Vex, and then I took it back, and I sat on it for a little bit, and I was going to do it as a raw song. And then I had Lejean here at my house for a week working on his solo stuff, and you know we had already discussed him singing on the raw record, 
And he, um, you know, I wasn't uh, quite sure which song I was going to do, but then I realized that that song sort of uh, suited him, especially to what we were doing together for his solo stuff. So I was excited to sort of put that out and have that as a teaser for some of the stuff that might, you know, that that he has coming out. And um, so those three songs were written for other artists. Everything else on the record were written was written for this record, and is new. I gotta say, LeJohn Witherspoon, man, he's so damn awesome vocalist, man. Seven Dust, you can't go wrong with that band at all. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, so you know, another facet that I've been talking about about these features because you know the truth is is that. I wasn't really, there was no game plan to have features on this record originally. My attorney, who happens to be Five Fingers attorney and Bad Wolves attorney and, and a whole bunch of other awesome bands, Ice on Kills and, and uh, High Road to Hero and Fire from the Gods, he, he and I were talking and he was just like, you should get features on your record. And I'm like, ah, I don't want to, do, everybody's doing the feature thing. He's like, yeah, but you know, it really helps. It helps to drive people to your page and it helps get the ball rolling and it helps to, to have people to talk about stuff. And, and I was like, okay, well, if I'm going to do features, then I want to do features in a way that really, really is directly connected to the band. And obviously the enough one makes sense with star set, but you know, here's, here's the way that I've been looking at it, you know, because so much of what seven dust did in the late nineties, early two thousands was, uh, was an incredible influence on, on Ra and the writing that went into Ra. And, you know, so I sort of viewed having Lejean as sort of paying respects to where the band comes from. And then I viewed having Dustin on as paying respects sort of to what the band might have inspired. You know, I mean, I've known Dustin for 10 years. He was a Ra fan back in the day. Um, but, you know, it, it it's one of those things where I was like, okay, well, this, this feels... We feel I feel connected to both of these people in the right way to make these features be meaningful and not just, hey, I'm trying to, like, get a famous guy on my song, you know? Right, right, gotcha. Did you guys want to create a newer sound for Raw, or did you want to stay true to the Raw sound? I think the intention was to write the newest possible sounding songs I could was absolutely to take the writing style, the melodies and the approach to be as contemporary as it would be if I was writing for a 20-year-old band today uh, in my studio that needs you know, songs that, that want to compete with I Prevail and, and Bring Me the Horizon and whoever else is cool and young, nothing more, blah, blah. <laughs> um, you know, so writing the songs, that was the thing. But I knew that by having Scooter Ben and PJ play on the album and by focusing heavily on prioritizing guitar drums and bass and vocals, it would still feel like us. It would still feel like us primarily because, well, two things. One, even though I was writing with newer things in mind, I was using the templates of our older songs. So something like Somewhere Beautiful, which is the last song on the album, that template is the sky template. So there's, there's, you know, the first record from one, there's a song that's a fan favorite called sky and it starts out, you know, sort of, you know, quieter and then has like a big eruption, but it only has two choruses. It goes, it goes into a big chorus and, and it ends in the chorus and that's it. There's no real other chorus. The first chorus is more of a pre-chorus. So the, so in doing somewhere beautiful, I sort of, I said, Oh, I want this to be that. And I want them. I want people to subconsciously or consciously recognize it as sounding like an old Ross song, even though it's totally and completely from a different perspective and has programming and has you know sound design things going on. So, you know, in creating a, a new album, the goal has to be to make something new. Um, I, I don't. I, I'm, a, I'm not a fan of bands that sort of regurgitate whatever the formula was that made them famous. Um, and I think that what works for, for me personally is to try and write, you know, things as timeless as possible, try and make the melodies and all this stuff. You know, I pull, I pull from a lot of modern pop artists. I pull from Juice World. I pull from rappers. I pull from, from, you know, um, different, the weekend, Kendrick Lamar, there's all kinds of things that are sort of showing up disguised in these rock songs that I that I like to pull from but I also try and make sure that I'm pulling from Sting and 
Peter Gabriel and Paul McCartney and Prince. And there's just a whole bunch of things that I'm trying to balance things that would have a short shelf life with things that I know are sort of long, long lasting and, and important over time. Were you guys a little nervous at all releasing this album right now since bands can't tour? I know you guys got the virtual concerts and things like that, and plus you guys have your virtual concert re-airing this Friday, tomorrow. But uh, were you guys a little nervous at all? No, not really. If anything, I was sort of psyched about it because, you know, here's the thing. You know, we we spend so much time as bands. When you're a rock band, you spend so much time thinking about Oh, uh, what band can I tour with? Where am I going to tour? How am I going to tour? How am I going to tour? But the world has changed. The world has changed dramatically. And, you know, it's weird that me, the old guy, I'm the one sitting here saying that a lot of that stuff doesn't necessarily apply the way that it used to. There are ways of building an audience online that are far more successful than going out and playing to 400 people a night. You know, there. Mm. The, I worked. I did the last record I did before this one that where I sang was doing Metal Cohen's record, and Metal's record. You know, it, it, it the exposure that she was able to give it is because she has 1.6 million subscribers on YouTube and 1.5 million peep friends on Facebook, and she never played a show ever. You know, I mean, when she toured on her first album, she played seven shows in like a two week period or something, like there was nothing. You know, Bad Wolves is a perfect example. And, you know, and this is sort of the value of, of things going viral and covers and things like that. But Bad Wolves had never played a show when uh, Zombie became a massive hit for them. Oh, yeah. You know, and yeah. yes, it's a cover and yes, it's sort of a thing. But that's, you know, there are plenty of bands that do covers that don't blow up like that. So the, the trick is, you know, to embrace what the modern world is actually doing and and to not feel necessarily limited um, by that. And then, you know, and then there is touring, right? But the, the idea of touring now is like, at least to me, tour when you have an audience, tour when there's someone to tour for. The idea of breaking your band via touring to me is an old idea. I think you need to do all the online work and do all the legwork and get a few hundred thousand people around the world that know who you are and then it's worth tagging on a tour and having those people invest in showing up but trying to tag on you know trying to buy on as the first of four bands opening for you know uh fire from the gods or something like that you know fire from the gods is a great band they're not you know they're they're blowing up in their own right but mm -hmm. they're you know they're not going to pull ten thousand people so it's like you're going to be you're going to be in front of a few hundred people at the beginning of a show that and it, and it you know it's extremely expensive and time consuming to tour whereas like you have this now we have social media which is a direct conduit to people and you know I love this virtual concert thing you know especially since the idea of sort of having some creative control over what it looks like and how it how it's going to feel is is not something you get when you play Joe Schmo's pub down the block and the PA doesn't work. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you have a lot of quality control issues that smaller bands don't have control over. And yes, you can be a great band and you can build your audience that way. And obviously certain kinds of metal bands have to because they don't really get airplay in the same way. But the building it, you know, doing the doing social media right, being online properly, and doing digital marketing and ads and everything in the proper way will help you to, you know, probably get your name out more than playing a bunch of shows to nobody. I got to say this right now, Mateo Cohen, she is a phenomenal musician, and I, you're right. I mean, she has a tremendous amount of people uh, that follow her, and she deserves it. She deserves every bit of it because she's a phenomenal musician. As far as you're talking about virtual, I want to say this right quick, too. Uh, the Dropkick Murphys has done three virtual concerts, man, and they have knocked it out of the ballpark. I mean, these guys have busted their ass off on this virtual stuff, and it, it, it's been there forever. It, it's another outlet for you all. It, I think it's great. People could pay for concerts and sit at home and watch it. I mean, granted, we'd like to be at a show watching it, but it's just the same but in your comfort of your own home. I think what's going to happen now is it's just going to be both. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think bands are going to bands are going to do virtual concerts that people can purchase who don't who either don't live. You know, if if Shine Down doesn't go to Hungary, then then at least the people in Hungary can go watch a Shine Down show. 
You know what I'm saying? So right. it's like, why not set it up so that all those people who don't have access to you can see a show mm -hmm. and then also tour, you know, and yeah. then also put things together. I've, I, I've even talked about this and I've said this a million times. I told this to Nikki Six. I was like, why don't you franchise your band? Mm -hmm. Why don't you curate and, and create a Japanese Motley Crue. Why don't you curate and create a African Motley Crue? Like you like literally go and have regional versions of your band that you curate, meaning like you literally find the people and, and make it into a cool thing. And everybody's like, no, no one would like that. It's not cool. And I'm like, well, people do go see cover bands. So why not own your own cover band that does your material? Yeah. Seems like a no brainer to me. Yeah. Best of both worlds, man. Honestly. And, and there's a lot of cover bands that are awesome. You know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, best, best of both worlds. <laughs> any tracks standing up more to you than any right now, Shahaz, on this album? I, I know it must change every time you listen to it, and I know these are your babies, but uh, do you have any that stick out for you personally, maybe? So there's there's sort of like, uh, I was trying to explain this the other day, is, is I don't have favorite songs, I have favorite moments. So the way that I process this question is there are lyrics on this record and very typical with the raw stuff. I, a lot of times the lyrics are abstract and I sort of spend a lot of time writing them, but I'm not a hundred percent sure at the time what I'm talking about. <laughs> I know that doesn't make any sense. Like I, I mean a really good example, a perfect example is I wrote all the lyrics for fallen angels without actually at all understanding what that song was and it took about a year before it really just sort of popped into my head and i was realizing oh right <laughs> you know like i was com i was completely like that's what that is and you know i had an aha moment like that today at the gym um because i was listening to uh, there are a couple of my sort of diehard fans who loved this one song on the new record called divided and it's sort of building already. It's, it's only been out a week or whatever, but it's already building sort of its own um, cult following because people are really dissecting the lyrics. And I was listening to it today in the gym and a bunch of lyrics just sort of clicked. And I was like, whoa, this is a crazy song, <laughs> you know, almost listening to it as if I hadn't written it. But it was, but it's, there's a lot of stuff like that. So I'll say this much. Um, my guilty pleasure on the record and the reason why it's there is let's go to Mexico because that song for me is just absolutely like from a pop sensibility and just the melodies and the way it's constructed and the fact that it does what it does, but it's in tune to drop a, and it's weird. Like, I just love that song. That's my guilty pleasure. Then the, the other songs, um, I really love Loud. I think Loud is a banger from beginning to end. Like I, I just think that song has a lot of really cool, more more 2021 sort of intensity to it. And then I also really love Enough. I love the chorus of Enough. I love I love the bridge in Nobody Loves You. I love the lyrics in Till You Die. I mean, that first first thing of I will be your fireside is one of these lines that came out of me and I didn't even know what I meant. And then I realized, Oh yeah. Like <laughs> being at a fireside is like, it's like you feel warm, you feel safe, you feel like you're at home, you know? And it's like, Oh shit. Yeah, that's cool. You know? So I was like, I don't know. There's, there's a whole bunch of, um, moments that stick to me. The riff, the, the opening riff, uh, to let it lie is, you know, a, a great moment for me. So there's just, there's just moments. There's never, there's not one song. You know, if, if I'm speaking conceptually, conceptually my favorite song is Jezebel just because of what it encapsulates in terms of the raw legacy. You know, we had a song on Critical Mass called Brutiful, which was like genty and mappy. And then I obviously have always done a lot of things that were police influenced. And this song was My Roxanne, but with gent, like gent metal beats in it, you know? So it's like having the Jezebel thing and sort of like the lyric Jezebel Roxanne, the, the, the whole prostitute come, you know, thing. It, mm -hmm. it all just, it all just came together in that song sort of effortlessly. And the melodies are really cool. And it, I don't know, just, just very, very, um, like I said, very, very happy with, with that one as, as a whole. Um, the other thing also for me, really, if I'm honest is, is from a vocal perspective, I felt, 
far more confident. And I did a lot of singing on this record, but I didn't feel like I did a lot of takes. Meaning like, I wasn't searching for performances as much as I used to. I, there, there were times on old records where I would sing a song and then I would live with it and then I would re-sing it because I didn't like the way I sang it in terms of nuance and color. I didn't do that at all on this record. I sort of knew where everything was going to be, but I think I, that goes back to what I was saying before about how it was planned. You know, I really planned everything out, so I sort of had a preconceived notion of what the vibes were going to be. Was there a song that you guys were working on that was brought to the table that totally ended up sounding different or took a major turn than what it started out as, possibly? The sad thing is, and here's, I mean, it sounds like a sad thing. It's really not a sad thing. But the truth is, is that the original demos, the, the, the quick demos that I did, are very, very, very similar to the finished product. Oh, wow. There's very few songs that changed... If I played you the 10 or 11 songs that were like sort of the core of the original writing in their demo form, you'd be like, if I, did you even replay anything? Like, what did you replay? Because it all sounds the same, you know? And it's just me singing gibberish melodies, but almost all the melodies stayed exactly the same. Very few things changed. Who did the artwork for the album? So this is sort of a crazy story too. So we are working with... FM Music Management, they have like Nonpoint and Through Fire, they're a management company. Frank, who owns the company, or one of the owners of the company, has a guy that he's been working with for 20 years, 30 years, this guy named Christopher Jones, right? Simple name, right? Chris Jones, what do you think? And he tells me, yeah, I have in-house art. I have an in-house guy that does art. So, you know, I'm thinking to myself, ah, this guy's just, you know, he's just a guy that's gonna make flyers. It's, you know, like, I'm not thinking anything of it at all. And then at one point I said, hey, what do you, you know, here's some ideas. I'm trying to come, to up, come up with some T-shirt ideas. And he came up with two T-shirts that, like, my face melted off. And I was like, what? Like, how? And, and what was crazy is I, I don't think, I think I asked the question and had the designs, like, four hours later. Like, Jeez. they were just there. Magically, they just showed up. And then I started, we started talking about this, and we started talking about that. And then I said, well, I need a design just for the pre-sale. And he sent me one. And it was amazing. And I was like, okay, well, I love that. And I said, well, I'm thinking of doing this thing for the record. I want it to sort of be a play on the eye of Rob, but I want it to be mechanical. And I'm telling you, three hours later, he just sent me exactly what it is right now. Jeez. Like, I made one little tiny change. I changed the eye because the eye was robotic. And I said, can we make the eye organic, look more like an, an animal eye? And that's the only thing that I changed. Everything else is as he designed it in first shot. It's like he throws darts at the dartboard and just hits bullseyes every time. <laughs> Some people, man, they just get what you're talking about. They just have that natural feel of what you're needing. And that's I just awesome. Think, I just think he, 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 his ability, I mean, you know, I'm like, why is this guy just doing my stuff? He should be doing everybody's stuff. Like, oh, yeah. What is going on here? Yeah, it's beautiful artwork, man, for sure. I dig it. I like it a lot. What do you hope, Shahaj, everyone takes away or a message you hope they hear while listening to any of Raw's music in general, man? What do you hope they get from when they start to listen to it? Well, we've always tried to be, we've always tried to be um, a band that speaks on a hope and healing level. Like, that's sort of what the band has always been. There's no songs that aren't ultimately trying well there are some songs i wrote a song about jerking off to katie perry so i can't include this song <laughs> but there there is um you know the overarching message is typically um how can we evolve and not be sort of the base creatures that we tend to be and i guess that that also led it that also led it into why we made the record in the first place because obviously the country had become a mess and, you know, intercorrupted is really a play on words, but it, the meaning of it is, is, is very related to the last, you know, four to eight, 10 years of our country and where things have been sort of destroyed and where lines have been blurred and where people have been, you know, tribalized and forced to take sides and be sort of um, separate. You know, the, the idea of intercorruption, even though it sounds bad, is actually a good thing, I think, because 
you know, the intercorruption thing is us individually taking responsibility for creating our enemies, creating the opposite, creating, you know, if you're a right wing guy, y- you need that far left guy to be mad, to be angry. And if you're a left wing guy, you need that far right conservative guy so that you can be angry. So you're dependent on creating exactly what it is that you think you don't want, but you create it. You literally feed it by being the way that you are. And, you know, as a guy that was, that grew up in New York, I'm half Puerto Rican, half Russian Jew, grew up in New York, lived in Los Angeles, you know, and now I live in Indiana and talking to people here. Um, you know, one of the things that I love to do is have honest conversation and the honest conversations typically, uh, go very well because the fact is, is it's the people on the far, 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 far left and the people on the far, 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 far right who are making all the noise. Mm Mm-hmm. Most people are closer to the middle. And when you talk to them about stuff, you realize, yeah, we have more, we have tons of stuff in common. And we have tons of things that I'm conservative on and things that I'm liberal on. And you have things that you're liberal on and you don't even know it. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things where we, we talk, you know, we talk to each other instead of at each other. And without the, the mob that online conversations have, you know, when you get the second you touch on a subject that's, controversial online then teams you know all the team flags go start flying oh yeah and it's just stupid yeah you know, it's just pointless it's 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 not it's it becomes a game of i want to be less wrong than you it has nothing to do with let's figure out how to make this better yeah and i think you know the album is somewhat focused on that you know the album for me is something that pushes a message of be self-aware. Be self-aware first before you go out and try and affect change in the world. Because if you're unconscious and you're trying to affect change in the world, then you become a pawn to the people who are feeding you whatever information you're buying into. So that's sort of what we stand for. There you go. (laughs) Now, I know you had a lot of music growing up. I know you did. But did you have an album or a song when you were younger that just affected you or just maybe let you get away or escape for a little bit? Did you just have that one go-to album or maybe just a couple of songs that did that for you possibly? You're talking about the period from when I'm five years old to about 11 years old. And the thing about that period is, is that I changed my... Um, my focus eclectically uh, very aggressively. So when I was very, very young, my brother had brought home a lot of fusion jazz and I was really into I mean, this. This makes no sense because I'm five years old, but I loved this band called Return to Forever, which was a fusion jazz band with Chick Corea, Stanley Clark, Lenny White, and Al Demiola. And I was obsessed with it as a kid, as a child. I was just, I couldn't get enough of it. It led me to... Um, Peter Gabriel and, and, and the police. But in between that, somebody in my junior high school, when I was like seven or eight, um, handed me Paranoid by Black Sabbath. And, and I think I listened to Iron Man on vinyl probably five times a day for like six months. Just that song. That one and Fairies Wear Boots. Oh, I was yeah. obsessed with... I was obsessed with Ozzy and I became an Ozzy crazy person. But <laughs> at the second, at, at the second, like the eighties rolled in 80, 81, I was already very, very, very much into, um, run DMC and then LL Cool J and then the BBC boys. So I was very much, um, a Def Jam kid while I was still listening to, Peter Gabriel and, and the police, the police was huge. And then eventually Prince, Prince was actually the first concert I ever went to in my life. And, uh, Prince, you know, was, was to me one, you know, watching him sing the beautiful ones in 1984 in the movie theater, watching purple rain was, I know that that was the moment I was like, I want to do this. I want to do that too. And that was, you know, the beginning of my fantasy, you know, I know that you have a very impressive list of artists that you have worked with, man, but do you have a favorite moment with with one specific artist that you've worked with that sticks out the most possibly? I mean, you worked with Nikki Six, you worked with Tommy Vex and all these and Lejean. 
and um, star sets. I mean, let's talk about that a little bit. Do you have a favorite moment possibly for you that uh, sticks out the most, maybe? A, possi- a, a favorite moment? I mean, the whole Motley Crue thing was very surreal, right? It's, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, having this guy that, that launched a thousand, uh, you know, a million clones um, and started the Sunset Strip, long hair, crazy, you know, I mean, they really created glam rock. Um, to have this guy at my house for months was pretty crazy, you know? I mean, pretty pretty remarkable. I mean, we still talk. We don't talk all the time, but we get on the phone for an hour or so every few months, and he is uh, a, you know, he's someone I consider a friend, but also just, you know, there's there's a mutual respect, and it's really, really cool. Um, I wasn't a Motley Crue fan growing up. So I think that actually helped sort of create a a relationship that was a little bit less based on me trying to kiss his ass every five seconds (laughs) and actually being honest. Yeah. Um, So that, you know, there's a lot of surrealness about having, you know, I'll tell you this much. When I was on tour and I hung out with Dave Draymond or I hung out with uh, Corey Taylor or I hung out with, um, the guys from Seether, or I hung out with the guys from Trapped, or the guys from Godsmack, whatever. Lejean, all those. Just everybody has amazing, amazing tour stories and rock stories. And you, you know, when you, you're done after six or seven years of touring, you say to yourself, "Oh, I've heard all the good ones." Until Nikki Six comes to your house and tells you what an what a real rock story is. Because you realize that all the rock stories you heard from everyone else are just the shitty versions of, of real rock stories like that Motley Crue tells. Those dudes, they did things on a level that was so far and beyond what any other band really was able to even afford. <laughs> so it was, it, it's just pure chaos. I mean, some of those stories are just, they'll never leave my brain. But, you know, that part of it was very surreal. Um, but from an artistic standpoint, you know, at, at least to date, because the Lejean stuff I'm doing right now is starting to really, really, I'm just so happy with it. But um, to date, I have one song that I did with Starset called Die For You that for me personally is sort of my crowning achievement outside of rock. Um, and to me, that Starset song sort of, st- sort of, encapsulates everything I love about, you know, modern music, you know, for me. I just think that song, you know, and the creation of it was not necessarily um, particularly magical. It was more of me demoing something, sending it to Dustin, him liking it, throwing down some vocals. Like, I don't even know if we worked on that in the same room more than for one day. But we did a lot of stuff remotely with that one, and it just became one of my favorite songs. And, you know, streaming-wise, it's got, I don't know, 25 million streams, so obviously other people like it too. But um, it, 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 it is very, it's very hard to say that there's um, a collaboration or a writing session that I... I'll, I'll tell you something recently that actually was a big deal, and I get to repeat this actually next month. Um, I, I, in the summertime, I went out to work with Jason Hook, the guy that you know just left Five Finger, right. and um, I ended up doing a song with a song. It wasn't my song; I was just there to record it. But I ended up doing a song with Chad Chad Gray, and weirdly, you know, talking about all the people that I know and all these bands, I really loved Mudvayne. I really loved Mudvayne. Mudvayne was one of those bands that mixed artistry and metal and craziness and everything. And I, I just loved Mudvayne. I love that fucking band. So yes, working with Chad for a, working with Chad for a day, um, was really sort of, that was a big deal. I mean, it really was. We didn't, we didn't work on a song that I had written. So it was a little bit less exciting from that perspective, but it was just great to spend the day with him. I ended up going over to his house with hook later on in the day, but, um, What was really, really cool, well, what is really, really cool is that song ended up getting scrapped, and we're doing a new one, and I wrote the new one. 
<laughs> so we're, I'm going out and I'm going out next month to, to spend the day with him again. But I've talked to him on the phone a bunch of times since then. And we've, you know, we're like buddies now, but he, um, he is, he is, a, I, I don't know. He's a beautiful dude, but, but like, I really respect Mudvayne. Just, I just, just something about that band that has always made me sort of feel like, oh, this is existing on a different plane than a lot of other bands. Yeah, it's it's like they they made you take awareness of them when they were on stage. They made you pay attention to them. It was just like, fuck you, we're here. Listen, you know, it's in Dig is a, a badass song. Uh, Fall into Sleep is my favorite song by Mudvayne. Uh, Happy's another good song. I mean, th- th- their whole inventory is great. I just remember watching the Not Falling video where they're dressed like aliens yeah. and just freaking out and loving that song so much. <laughs> they're just a great band, man. And I wish they, I wish they'd come together and make a new album. I, I really wish well, folks, you want to get out and pick up Raw's new album entitled intercorrupted via wake up music rocks. You want to pick this album up and support Raw's as always check out their old stuff as well. You won't be disappointed. So, uh, Sahaj, how can folks stay in touch with you guys, pick up this new album, tour dates when this all happens, hopefully sooner than later, or just keep up with you guys? How can they do that? The best way is just go to our website. Our website is rawband.net, just R-A-B-A-N-D.net. We've had it since 2002. It's our website, literally, and we've made it really simple. It's not one of those complicated websites where you have to go and do math to get to the pages. We have all the links right there on the front second you get there you can go to spotify you can go to facebook you can go to instagram you can go to wherever you want to go we got them all right there we've got a merch store and uh you know so you can hit that up too if you want to get some cool stuff and that's it it's all right there robband.net and before i let you go good sir would you care to do a promo for my show absolutely hey it's sahaj from the band Ra, and you're listening to bod's mayhem hour Everybody stick around. We've got some great, great stuff coming up, and you only hear these interviews right here on Bod's Mayhem Hour and Bod's Mayhem Podcast. Please get out and check out our Facebook page. It has our podcast link, YouTube link, and you want to subscribe to our YouTube link because every tier we give stuff out free. Freebies, CDs, everything you know, we give away on our show. So check that out. Check out Raw. Grab their new album, Intercorrupted, via Wake Up Music Rocks. You won't be disappointed. So Sahaj, man, thank you for putting some new Raw stuff out. Honestly, thank you. Well, we are super stoked to be back, and we're excited that uh, people seem to like the record. So thank you for having me on, and we will talk soon. Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.